So my lab studies the basic neural and cognitive mechanisms that mediate human learning. And one of the first breakthroughs that we made was to realize that humans have multiple uh, learning systems. And for the most part, these different systems are functionally and anatomically distinct. They evolved at different times for different purposes. They're best suited for learning different kinds of information and they learn in qualitatively very different ways. So today I'm going to tell you about a couple of the systems that we study uh, primarily and describe some of the properties that we've discovered of these systems. So the first system is, is very familiar to everyone. If you, um, if you ask anyone about learning, this is, this is what they assume you're talking about. This is the system that mediates virtually all the learning that occurs when you uh, hear a lecture or uh, read a book. Uh, so this is pretty familiar. The, the less familiar system in psychology is known as procedural learning system. And uh, colloquially, this is often referred to as muscle memory. And usually people only think of muscle memory as um, being important in video game playing and, and athletic skills and things. But it turns out there's a lot of evidence that this memory system or this learning system is very important for almost all cognitive skills. So um, this is the system that where performance improvements occur only with repeated practice that includes lots of uh, immediate feedback. You can not become an expert piano player by reading uh, a book about it. You have to practice. And this is the system that's mediating those improvements that you see because of the practice. Okay, so... Uh, the problem is that most real-world skills probably depend heavily on both of these systems. So, for example, you can learn to play the piano by, by practicing, but you're not going to become an expert, or at least if you do become an expert, you're going to be better if you actually read books about uh, playing a piano. Uh, because you can read a book and you can learn about the structure of scales, you can learn about octaves, you can learn about sound, you can learn how to read music, and all of those abilities is, are going to help your piano playing. So, if in a laboratory setting, a study learning, if we were to use a real world task and we saw a performance improvement, we wouldn't know which system was mediating that improvement. So, the second big breakthrough that we made was to design tasks, learning tasks, that isolate these different systems. And once you have a system isolated, then any improvement that you see, you know, is due to that system that's been isolated. So um, let me now describe the tasks that we use. They're very kind of artificial tasks. Uh, so we use these artificial objects. These are called sine wave gratings. And that's because as you move orthogonally to those bars, the luminance is varying as a sine wave. But every one of these disks that we show people has exactly the same size, shape, and contrast, and they only vary in how thick those bars are and the orientation of the bars. So uh, we use these stimuli because subjects, most people have no ex prior experience with these objects, and if we use familiar objects, then we would always have to worry about whether their prior learning before they came into our lab would, was interfering with the, uh, the tasks that we were actually trying to get them to learn. So that's why we use the artificial objects. Okay, so in the experiment, typical experiment, someone comes into our lab, we tell them, okay, now you're gonna see a bunch of these circular disks. There's two categories of these disks, we're gonna call them A and B. Here's two buttons, an A button and a B button. And your job is to learn how to assign each disk to its correct category. And that's the, pretty much the only instructions they get. Of course, in the first trial, when they see it like this disk, they have no idea if that's an A or a B. They just randomly guess and press a button, but then they get feedback as to whether that response was correct or incorrect. Then they get a new disk, make another response, get feedback, and this process uh, continues over and over and over. Minimum would usually be six to 800 different disks, which we can do in about uh, 50 minutes. But we've also studied how these kinds the behaviors become automatic and in those experiments we've had uh, we would generally show people as many as 15,000 discs over the course of you know every day they train for an hour for maybe a whole month 
So uh, those experiments, you have to pay people because uh, not the most exciting task in the world. Okay, so the way we can um, isolate these different systems is by varying the rule that we use to create the two categories that people are trying to learn. And so here's an example of a task that you can learn using an explicit reasoning um, approach. And as you can see, uh, category A has bars that have steep orientations, and category B has, have bars that have shallow orientations. Each one of those little symbols denotes a different disk. So in this, in this particular experiment, there are uh, 300 different disks in A and 300 different disks in B. But in general, if you just respond A to any, any disk with a steep orientation, you're going to be uh, correct. And if you respond B to any disk with a shallow orientation, you're going to be correct. It's a pretty easy task. As you can imagine, people learn this pretty quickly. At the end of the training, if you ask people what they're doing, they very accurately uh, can describe that rule. So this is, a, this is a task that's been studied in psychology for more than 100 years. All right, more interesting is how do we get a task that uh, loads on the procedural system. And the way we do that is we just rotate everything by 45 degrees, and now we have categories that are impossible to learn via explicit reasoning. And the reason for that is because there's no verbal description of that diagonal uh, category boundary. So in this task, people, uh, they learn very well. They can get to be extremely accurate, but it takes longer, it takes more practice. And if you ask people at the end of their training uh, what they were doing, uh, you get a very set of pretty interesting responses. In fact, the title of my talk, uh, I have no idea how I did that, is a quote from a subject who is in this condition. This is a person who was responding correctly with accuracy above 90%. And, at the, and we asked them, well, what were you doing? I have no idea what I was doing. Uh, you get a lot of interesting responses. People say things like, oh, I couldn't figure it out, so I went with my gut reaction. Or surprisingly, we have a lot of people say things like, I couldn't figure it out, so I started humming to myself and pressing buttons, and suddenly I did really well. So from the subject's perspective, this is a completely different experience. Uh, but it's the very similar stimuli, and, and learning is, uh, is very good. Okay, so um, here's the actual example of, of category structures that we've used in a number of different experiments. And if you look, you can see, for example, that the two conditions are identical except for a 45 degree rotation. Because, for example, if you look at the two little outliers in the rule-based uh, A category at the top, you can see those same two little outliers in the information integration condition in the upper right uh, part of the screen. And so, because they're just rotations of each other, what that means is that the two conditions are exactly equated on all category separation statistics. So, for example, if you were to input these coordinates into any statistical uh, clustering analysis routine, the routine would have to perform identically on the two conditions. Because all those routines care about is how widely separated the, the two categories are. But there's an enormous performance difference in humans. So humans can learn the rule-based condition in about 80 trials, which only is really about 10 minutes of practice. They're really accurate. But in the information integration condition, to get the same level of accuracy requires almost an order of magnitude more training. All right, so the first important question is, why is there such a big performance difference in humans in these two conditions? And our argument is, well, it's because humans bring very different systems to these two different conditions. In the rule-based condition, they have this explicit reasoning system that lets them very quickly figure out the optimal strategy. That system fails in the procedural learning, in the information integration condition, and they try different explicit rules. Nothing seems to work. Eventually, they get frustrated and give up pass control over this phylogenetically older procedural learning system, and then finally you get this very incremental uh, increase in accuracy. Now, especially when we were first proposing the idea that humans have these multiple systems, many reviewers of our papers didn't buy that argument. 
And instead, they wanted to claim, no, there's got to be some inherent difference in the, in the tasks themselves. In other words, the difference in performance is not in the learner's head. It's actually in the category structures. And uh, the basic they would argue something like, well, the information integration condition, you have to attend to two dimensions, you only need to attend to one dimension in the uh, rule-based condition, that's just fundamentally easier. So uh, to test between those two possibilities, that is whether the difference is in the mind of the learner or it's in the structure of the categories, we had the idea, well, what if we were to run this experiment on a simpler species? that doesn't have a well-developed explicit reasoning system. And uh, it, uh, there's actually a lot of evidence now that the rule-based uh, system, the system that learns well in the rule-based task, depends very heavily on cortex, and especially prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain behind your forehead. So ideally, we would have a species that had no cortex, because that species should not have a well-developed explicit reasoning system. And here's uh, Gary Larson's take on uh, such a species. Well, time for our weekly brainstem storming session. Uh, so we, we don't have dinosaurs, but we do have their ancestors, birds. So we actually ran this experiment on pigeons. They saw exactly the category structures I just showed you. And the pigeon would see a disc on every trial. And rather than call the categories A and B, we use color names. So there were the red category and the blue category. For example, if that disc was in the red category, if the, if the pigeon pecked the red key, uh, it would get a food reward. If it pecked the blue key, it would get a timeout and would have to wait. And the, the experiment was run simultaneously and independently in two different labs, one in Massachusetts, one in New Zealand, but the results were identical. They're summarized there on the right. That's the uh, mean number of training sessions until the pigeons learned the categories. And you can see there's absolutely no difference between the rule-based and the information integration conditions. The pigeons learn both category structures fine and at exactly the same rate. So if the performance difference shown by humans was something that was inherent to the task, a cognitively simpler species like a pigeon should do even worse on the, on the task that, that's difficult for humans. But instead, uh, the difference disappears. So we take this, this is very strong evidence that the reason that humans perform so differently in these tasks is not because of the categories themselves, but because of how the human mind tries to learn the categories. There's a fundamental difference. All right, so we've spent a lot of time trying to reverse engineer the neural networks that are mediating these different kinds of learning. And this is a cartoon that shows the major structures in the explicit reasoning system that dominates in the rule-based task. And um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of different uh, brain areas here. The central hub, though, is the prefrontal cortex. Uh, that seems to be the, the most important structure for this kind of learning. The procedural learning system depends on subcortical structures. This is one reason that we know that it's phylogenetically older, uh, because the brain evolved upwards. And um, in particular, the procedural learning system depends on a, a collection of subcortical nuclei called the basal ganglia. The major input structure of the basal ganglia is called the striatum, and it includes two uh, regions, the caudate nucleus and the putamen. And this is a little, um, again, a cartoon. This is a simplified version of the procedural learning model. But basically, the idea is that uh, procedural learning is mediated by these loops from cortex, originally visual cortex, which is perceiving the, the objects, into the basal ganglia, and then up into motor areas, which are selecting motor responses. And the learning is facilitated by dopamine that gets released from the upper brainstem, the substantia nigra pars compacta, and it, that dopamine gets released into the synapses. And the idea is that um, behaviors that are rewarded by, with positive feedback, are, those synapses get strengthened, and behaviors that lead to negative feedback, uh, the synapses get weakened. And it's through that strengthening and weakening process that this system is able to learn these seemingly arbitrary stimulus response associations that, that are important in the information integration task.
Okay, so now what I want to do is zoom down on that one synapse, and let's look in more detail what's going on there. So this is the synapse, and you can see the, um, there's the terminal end of the axon. This is a neuron from visual cortex that's responding to the disc. So when the disc is presented, that neuron starts firing. It releases glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter, which diffuses across the synapse, binds to molecules, on the spine of these medium spiny neurons. Those are the principal neurons in the, in the striatum. Then if the synapse is strong, that neuron is gonna start firing and it'll lead through a couple more synapses up into motor areas and the person will press, say, the A button. If that's the correct response, the computer that's running the experiment will recognize that as correct and deliver positive feedback. Tell the subject, yes, you were correct, yay. And then um, the subject wants to be correct so the brain interprets that as, great, that's a reward, uh, stimulates the dopamine neurons, and then dopamine will get released into the synapse. But there's an uh, immediate timing problem that we have here, right? Because the dopamine gets released after uh, the feedback, which is after the motor response, which is after the activity at the cortical striatal synapse. So how does the system know which synapses were responsible for the behavior that was rewarded? Uh, the only way that could possibly work is if there's a trace in the spine of the active synapses. And there's been a lot of work in biochemistry on those traces. And if anybody's interested later, I can give more details. But basically, it turns out that there's a trace that lasts for about two seconds. After two seconds, it's gone. So that means you have a very, very strong prediction if this is a mechanism. Because that means in the information integration task, if we tell people whether they're correct or incorrect on every trial, but we simply make them wait two and a half seconds to find out if their response was correct or not, the trace will be gone and the system won't know which synapses were responsible for the behavior and therefore there shouldn't be any learning. So that experiment has been done uh, a number of times. The rule-based condition, by the way, in the, in the explicit system in prefrontal cortex, you have access to working memory Working memory can hold things for easily up to a minute. So a few seconds delay and the feedback should have no effect on performance in that task. And so here's an example of one, at one of these experiments. The rule-based, this is a two and a half second delay. The rule-based condition, um, in fact, delays of up to 10 seconds have no effect on, on uh, learning in the rule-based condition. Two and a half second delay basically eliminates all learning in the uh, information integration condition. So there's a profound difference in the sensitivity to the timing of feedback between these two systems. Um, let's just quickly look at a couple of other properties. Another one is, you know, I said that procedural learning is known as muscle memory. Well, muscle memory implies that there's a motor component. So where's the motor component in this simple task where we're just having people pressing buttons? If you look at the, at the little diagram I showed you before, notice that the terminal end of learning in this procedural system is in premotor cortex. So the, the motor component is a fundamental part of the network. In the explicit reasoning system, there's a whole bunch of areas there. None of those are in motor cortex. So there's no motor component at all in, uh, in the explicit system. The only thing that's being learned in the explicit system, okay, that's an A and that's a B, and there's not, not necessarily a motor part of, the, of what's being learned. So to explore this further, we've done a number of experiments where we train people on these different kinds of categories. Their uh, left finger's on the A button, the right finger's on the B button, and they learn, learn the categories, uh, either rule-based or information integration. They get really, really accurate. And then at the last 10 minutes of the session, we just reverse the buttons. And we tell people, we say, okay, now the, the A button's on the right and the B button's now on the left. Go ahead and keep doing what you're doing. Keep responding accurately. It turns out in the rule-based condition, no problem at all. There's not any drop at all in accuracy. But in the information integration condition, people just fall apart. They can't do it anymore. So in the rule-based condition, what people are learning is, okay, that's an A, that's a B, that's an A, that's a B. In the information integration condition, what they're learning is that's a press the button on the left, that's a press the button on the right, that's a press the button on the left. So the motor component is a fundamental part of what's being learned. If we switch the buttons, we've interfered with what they've learned and their performance uh, falls apart. 
another, another example of a difference between these two systems is um, how abstract or general is the knowledge that's acquired in these diff two different paradigms. Well, in the, um, sorry, in the uh, explicit system, what's being learned is abstract rules. A's have steep orientations, B's have shallow orientations, or maybe A's are thick bars and B's are thin bars. And if you learn that abstract rule, you should be able to apply it to a novel stimulus you've never seen before. So the learning should be very abstract, whereas in the procedural system, what's being learned is an association between a specific stimulus and a specific motor response. So uh, if you go to a new stimulus you've never seen before, it's a new synapse that hasn't been trained, and there should be very little generalization. Okay, so this is how we tested that prediction. Uh, we trained people on in either the rule-based or the information integration condition on the categories shown in the red boxes. And then after they learned those categories, we tested them on the category shown in the blue boxes. And during the test, there was no feedback provided. We just said, keep doing what you're, you've been doing. And notice that if they're learning a general rule or a general strategy, performance should transfer perfectly because it's exactly the same rule and exactly the, or exactly the same strategy for the test stimuli as for the training stimuli. And here's the results. You can see for the rule-based condition, they don't even drop 1% in accuracy, even though these are stimuli they've never seen before. They're just as accurate as they were at the end of training. But in the, procedure, in the information integration uh, condition, performance drops all the way to uh, chance. So there's no knowledge, uh, no abstract knowledge acquired uh, in the procedural system. It's simply learning associations between what it's seen and the motor behavior it's practiced. You can't generalize that knowledge uh, at all. And so, for example, you know, when you're studying for exams, a lot of the practice that you do, uh, the rote practice you do, for example, when you're doing uh, math homework, is training up this procedural system. So remember that that, that knowledge doesn't generalize to novel situations. It needs to have exactly the same stimuli and, and motor response. Okay, so, so far I've been talking about learning. Practice virtually any skill enough, it becomes automatic, right? And we also now have evidence that the neural networks that mediate automatic behaviors is different from the networks that mediate the initial learning of those behaviors. So there's a transition from the learning networks to some new automaticity networks. And I just want to talk real briefly about our work uh, on that problem. So we have proposed uh, like 10 years ago that automaticity is mediated by cortical, purely cortical networks where you have direct projections from, say, visual cortex into the motor and premotor targets that mediate the, the movements in the task. Now, we know that there are many such uh, direct projections from visual areas and it's other sensory areas into motor targets. Um, those are shorter, they have fewer synapses than the learning networks I, I showed earlier. So therefore, they're gonna be more efficient. They're gonna allow for quicker responding so then the question is, well, if you have those networks, why do you need these learning networks? Well, it turns out that in cortex, um, synaptic strengthening follows different rules from the basal ganglia. And in particular, in cortex, any active synapses get strengthened. So for example, if you um, are practicing a behavior and the first time you do the behavior, you get the correct response, you get positive feedback, then the cortical network synapses that were active are gonna get strengthened. But then on the next trial, if you make an error, the cortical synapses that, that mediate that error are also gonna get strengthened, so you're not gonna be able to learn to inhibit that behavior in the future. So our hypothesis was that uh, the, the role of these learning systems is to train up these cortical cortical networks that are highly efficient and the way the training works is that the subcortical networks will activate the correct postsynaptic target in motor cortex, 
And then because of that extra activation by the, by the learning network, you're going to have more activity at the correct synapse than at the incorrect synapse. And so there'll be more strengthening at the correct synapse than the incorrect synapse. And then eventually that's going to allow the system, the cortical system to uh, emit the correct behaviors without the help of the subcortical network. So I've got an example of this. Um, this is a patient, 50-year-old patient, who has profound uh, Parkinson's disease. And Parkinson's disease is a disease that kills the dopamine-producing neurons in the brain. And the basal ganglia get a very uh, dense dopamine projection. So uh, in Parkinson's disease, the basal ganglia are highly dysfunctional. And as a result, this patient has extreme difficulty initiating novel movements because the basal ganglia are critical for initiating novel movements. And you can see that this, this guy can, uh, has extreme difficulty even walking. But the theory that I just described predicts that he should be able to execute automatic skills uh, fluidly because the automatic skills will be cortical to cortical bypassing the damaged basal ganglia. And here's a, here's a very strong uh, test of that prediction. Uh, I don't know who had the courage to ask for permission to run this experiment, but uh, it wasn't me. But uh, So here's the guy who couldn't even walk, but he gets on the bicycle. Why can he ride the bicycle? Because there's many sensory cues associated with riding a bicycle. He rode a bicycle his whole life before he had Parkinson's disease, and now he's got all the tactile cues from holding the handlebars, pedaling the, the, the uh, you know, moving his feet on the pedals, the visual flow, the sight of the bicycle, all those sensory cues have been trained so much, they're projecting into the correct motor targets and allowing him to execute fluidly, bypassing the damaged basal ganglia. Now you can see he's got a, I like his little smile there, it's hard to see, but as soon as uh, she takes the bike, he's going to, now he can't walk again. Okay, so that's an example of uh, how um, these different memory systems contribute in very interesting ways. All right, so just to conclude, um, humans, we now have enormous amounts of evidence that, that humans have multiple learning systems, and it's probably also the case that becoming adept at any real-world skill, certainly any difficult real-world skill, is going to require contributions from all of these systems. And one reason for that is because the knowledge that they supply are, is complementary. It's not redundant. So procedural learning can, can uh, help a skill in a way that ex explicit knowledge can never uh, help it, and vice versa. Uh, and the other important uh, point here is that these different systems thrive under very different kinds of conditions. I, I think I only showed you three qualitative differences. We now documented up to something like, I think we're at uh, 27 different qualitative differences in how these systems learn. So if you want to train a complex skill, you can't just succeed with one training method because one training method might work for one of the systems, but it's not going to work for the others. And so you have to tailor the training to the different particular system that's being, uh, that's, that's being uh, trained. Okay, and thank you.